O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Good morning, my friends, my brothers and sisters. I miss you. Probably now more than ever, I realize uh, how much I miss people. I haven't always been accused of being a people person, but uh, you know, I definitely am at the point where I really miss people. And even just having a Zoom uh, meeting with some of you this week uh, has been a blessing just to be able to have a conversation and see each other and I've been blessed to meet with a few of you you know and so you know just just looking forward to the day when we can meet I know we've been saying that each month each week and it's been kind of ongoing but just am believing for that day and believing that you know I'm praying for you I'm loving you I miss you Believing that, you know, you're going to be um, encouraged in this season with what God is saying, with what um, His presence with you, and that today, even as we're meeting, you know, I'm here in, in the Nakaroo office of County Leash sharing with you uh, on the screen that God's going to just be present here with us supernaturally and do something. And... Uh, so we just today, we finished, it's Saturday right now for me, but uh, I, I am uh, just finished the CCI conference, Christian Churches Ireland, of which we are part of, with uh, churches from all over the island. And again, we gathered on YouTube and it was really, it was a really good uh, conference time, some really good uh, messages. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share those links for Friday night and Saturday night. I believe that they'll still be available by tomorrow, you know, by Sunday, so that you'll still be able to click on them and view them. But some really good content there, some messages on dreaming with God, messages on a astounding faith, message on fighting the good fight, uh, just some really excellent uh, content. And Heather and I were both encouraged. I know I've talked to a number of people that were uh, able to join us online live. Um, and But most of all for me, what I was really blessed by was the interview with Katie Taylor, really moving. And so that happened at the end of day two. Just really encourage you to have a look at that because it'll actually coincide a little bit with what God has lined up for me to share today. Some of the stuff that she shared and it was, you know, all, all throughout the conference actually, there was a theme running through it and I found it really encouraging that what I had actually prepared to share kind of integrated with what was happening with the Planting Heaven Fighting Irish Conference. So um, just encourage you to do that. Also, we are entering into the last week of our uh, church prayer and fasting. We've been doing this for, we will have, once we complete it, it'll be 21 days. And um, it's been a blessed time. Just believing that God has been speaking uh, to a number of you. Uh, I'm hearing testimonies of what God's doing. I know 
he's doing stuff among us. And I've just been really encouraged by the uh, also this prayer calendar. So I'm going to put the link again for the videos for the CCI conference in the description below. And I'll also put a link to this if any of you want it for the last week. This is just a prayer calendar for the 21 days. And it has some scriptures and some themes for each day of the week uh, for the three weeks. And I found this very interesting as well with what I was talk have been talking about as we're looking in the first three chapters of Revelation, that these three weeks that have coincide with what I shared, the first week of prayer was on for, for vision, for vision for my life, for my family, for growth, for church, for my career, for serving others, for my nation. And in my first week of the message in this um, book of Revelation, I was talking about that we need to see Jesus, that we need to have a vision of him as we walk with him as his church. So I thought that was cool. Then I also found it cool that week two was a week of love. So we're praying for love for God, love for the Bible, love for my community, love for my enemies, love for my family, love for my church, love for prayer. And I love that last Sunday we got to share, I got to share about our first love, that we, God desires us to have an enthusiastic, passionate love that just, you know, is on fire for Him. And so He encourages His church in that way. And then this week is actually a week about faith. And so we're praying for faith for healing, faith for finances, faith for breakthroughs, faith for um, revival, faith for salvations, faith for peace, and faith for miracles. And what I'm going to speak about today uh, coincides with faith. It's very connected with faith, really, underlying it. And um, so we're going to get into it. Uh, it. Yeah, let me just tell you to start with, I, I was remembering again, many of you know that I, I grew up, uh, my favorite pastime growing up was uh, basketball. And uh, every September uh, of my high school years as a teenager um, was a time that I both loved and hated. And that was the beginning of basketball season and returning to practices. And so I loved it because basketball was just like, I was so passionate about basketball. I was no superstar. I was... I was not an amazing player, but I loved to play, and uh, I really enjoyed it, and I did okay with, on my team and stuff, and I just always had fun. A lot of my uh, really great memories as a teenager were coincided with basketball, and just had a lot of fun with friends, and, and just enjoyed it. But the reason that I hated September was it, because, it was because we were returning to practice, and for the whole summer... As you can imagine, I didn't train at all. So the reason that I hated it is because I would return to training and I would be entering into pain. And for the first two or three weeks of practice, uh, all our coach would have us do is run. And the reason is, is because he knew we were all out of shape and he needed to get us back into shape. So we would rarely touch the basketball for the first few weeks. We would just be running and probably one of his favorite, it seemed like, uh, drills was called killers. And this is basically where you all, the whole team lines up together and you race against each other as fast as you can. You just go back and forth on the court a little, you go quarter way, half ways and full, full ways and then back and back and back. So you just do that. And this is the time people are vomiting, getting sick afterwards, they're falling on the ground. We would just, we would do this and it was so painful and it was horrible. But yet at the same time, we loved it. There were those though that did participate and you very quickly found out who actually was committed to being on the team in those first two or three weeks because it was so difficult through that season. And uh, what's my point in saying all of that? My point is to remind us that we are actually kingdom athletes, that God has called us to be athletes. We, we see it throughout scripture. And so I want to look at this um, 
this theme of uh, athletics, really. But I want to look at it into the context of pain and troubles. And so I'm going to read this passage. This is, again, we're looking at the letters of Jesus to his churches. There are seven churches that he's writing to, but there are, you know, this, these letters are for all churches. They're for our church here in Port Leash. So let's look at it. Revelations chapter 2, verse 8. And uh, this is the church in, in Smyrna. And this is what it says. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Wow. Powerful. Powerful word. And um, what I want to really look at, you know, I've kind of given you some ideas, but what I'd like to title this really is just troubles. I want to talk about troubles. Three kind of thoughts that I am pulling out of this in regard to troubles. And we all will have troubles, right? And uh, some of us will have some extreme troubles. And this church was entering into and living through some extreme troubles. And what does Jesus say to his church? First of all, he says, troubles are real. Troubles are real. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander that you're experiencing. He goes on to say, you are about to suffer. Some of you will even be thrown into prison. You will be tested and some of you will die. And Jesus uh, gave this word to John to pass along to this church in Smyrna. And John was definitely somebody who was acquainted with troubles. We find out about him that he was actually um, uh, on lockdown on an island called Patmos. So he was experiencing, because of his faith in Christ, he was experiencing troubles. Uh, it says, you know, in his quarantine, he, he spent a lot of time in a cave, is what we read. And, and so John was acquainted with troubles. He, at that time, Christianity was actually illegal. And so to be a Christian, to have faith, and to live your Christian life was dangerous for you. You could lose your job, very likely. You would experience discrimination, and you could be, uh, you know, for the smallest reasons, you could be thrown into prison. And, and so it was a very difficult time for Christians, and he's writing to this church that was actually experiencing these very things. And, but you know what? It's not, I know sometimes we read, we read about this, and we feel like it's, oh, it's way out there. But, um, I know we're so blessed in the sense that we don't have to go through those things here in Ireland at this season, in this time. But in our world today, people are experiencing these very same things. In fact, I, I read there's an advocacy group called Open Doors, and they advocate for persecuted Christians. And they just recently, this month, released a report about the persecuted um, Christians around the world, and, and they said that um, in 2020, actually, persecution has increased by 60%. So they, in, in, as well, in their report, they said that around 340 million Christians are undergoing some sort of extreme uh, persecution in their walk. And so that's one out of eight Christians. And I know we, we wouldn't think of that because we're living in the Western world and, you know, we have a, a great heritage in a sense. We do experiencing some things, 
but not to the extent that other places are experiencing it. I'm thinking about, you know, some of the stuff going on in northern India, some of the things happening to Christians in China, North Korea. Uh, m many of you are from Africa, and there are places in Africa where this is extremely difficult to be a Christian. And so this is not all way out there. This is actually today that, that the church, our church, the church is experiencing. It's one in eight Christians, according to this report, are experiencing some sort of extreme persecution. And um, so that's, and not only that, thousands are dying every year. They said that, you know, there was this increase of 60%. In 2020, over 4,000 people were martyred for their faith, according to this report. So that's about, uh, I believe that's about 13 every day. So just, it's a reality, even though we don't always see it, even though we're not always aware of it, there is a reality of difficulty. And what Jesus says to them, he says, I know the troubles you're going through. I know your troubles today. So that's the, the first point. Troubles are real. Second point. Troubles are temporary. Jesus goes on to say some his um, just that command that we um, we've heard so many times, and but we need to hear it again. He says, "Do not fear." Look, look at what he says. He says um, right here, verse ten: "Do not fear what you are about to suffer." So he says, when you are looking in anticipation towards difficulty, my instruction to you is do not fear. Man, I know like that is so relevant to all of us, isn't it? We all have the tendency towards fear. We all have, like, you know, I think about the, the children of Israel as they were preparing to go spy out the land, the promised land. And they walked in and, and then they came back to give the report and they said, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So they got their eyes on themselves and they say, I, this is impossible. Um, th this is too scary. We can't do it. But Jesus comes and over and over, it's, it, I, I've heard it say that this is the most common command throughout scripture. Do not fear. I love my, it's one of my favorite verses is the word that God gave to Joshua, who was actually the one that was going to enter the promised land because the others had missed it. And his command was, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. I will be with you wherever you go. And so very often I just find myself when, when the feelings of fear arise, I just have to say to me, no, Jesus says, do not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear. I am strong and courageous. I will not be discouraged. I'm going to keep going. Lord God, I don't feel it. But Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you change those feelings. You give me faith. You, you give me something internally that is a strength to me to, to move forward. Even when I'm looking at the situation ahead of me that it seems very difficult, I thank you that you're going to help me not to fear. So Jesus says, do not fear. As we look in anticipation to hardship, Jesus says, don't fear. Then he says, as you are living through difficulty, what are you supposed to do? He gives us an instruction in regard to our troubles. He says, endure. Keep going. Keep moving. Persevere. So in order to move through troubles, it's important to know that they are temporary. And Jesus gives us two clear instructions. When you're preparing to look at them, you need to not fear. And when you're walking through them, you need to endure. And you can do that because you recognize that these things are temporary. But, but not only that, there is more to it than just realizing it's temporary. And, and that, is, um, that is this connection to our relationship with God, that God is with us wherever we go. And I love kind of just thinking about this continuation of the previous letter, right? And he talked to, to, to the church of Ephesus. He actually gave them a rebuke. He says, I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love, right? 
And he talked about you've lost the passion, you've lost the fire of relationship with me. But to the church in Smyrna, he actually doesn't give any rebuke to them. This is one of the few churches in these seven letters that he writes to that there's no actually rebuke to them. All there is is this call towards endurance, to keep going. And I love it because I, I, I learned this word that I've been hearing periodically, and the word is grit. And the definition of grit that I found out um, was, was it's a co combination of both passion and perseverance. So what was interesting to me was that the church in Ephesus they did have some endurance, but they had no passion. They had no first love. But this church in Smyrna, I believe, there was no rebuke for a lack of love. They had it. So they had grit, actually. They had first love. They had this passion for Jesus that, that was alive and living, and, and they were moving forward, through, but they had to move through difficulties and so they had perseverance and passion combined and so that's what we want and then when you have those two combined what does Jesus say to you he just says you're doing good keep going keep going keep moving keep going all right <laughs> so troubles are temporary also in connection with troubles are temporary I think it's important to know that troubles do something actually Troubles do something. And he, and he says here, let me, let me just read this here. <clears throat> he says, The devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and he says that you may be tested for 10 days. For 10 days. So I don't know exactly um, 10 days. What does that mean? Was it a literal 10 days? But what I see with 10 days, again, is, is that troubles are temporary. Not only that, though, he says that, that you may be tested. And so troubles allow you to be tested. Troubles do something. They are not without purpose. Amen. Hallelujah. What you're going through that is difficult is not purposeless. God can take your troubles and make something great out of them. And, and what's amazing in this is that not all troubles are from God. He actually says that these are coming from people. These are Jews. They're the synagogue of Satan, he calls them. Uh, he says the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. So we see not all our troubles are from God. But what is so awesome is, is that God can take those troubles, wherever they came from, doesn't matter where they came from, he can take those troubles and make something beautiful out of them in your life. And so he says that these will bring a testing into your life. And you remember the story of Peter and Jesus comes to him and he says, Peter, Satan has asked that he may sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. And what happens to Peter? Peter just goes through a season a night where he does everything he thought he would never do. And what is this sifting like wheat? Sifting like wheat is like, uh, they say it's like a vigorous shaking where you are separating the good wheat from all the debris, all the stuff that's useless, right? And so it's amazing how God can use troubles in order to shake us out, to shake out what is in us, that is of no good use. I think about, you know, we're in Ireland, so I think about tea. You put a tea bag in hot water and you find out what is inside that tea bag. It all just, you know, soaks out. And this is what trouble does. It soaks out what's inside of us. I know I've definitely been through many seasons of troubles and I've been able to see the, the lack and the, um, the failings within my own life. And so trouble has a way of doing, doing that. You know they, what they say, how do you create diamonds? You've got to put pressure on coal. How are pearls created? Through an irritation. How is gold purified? Through fire, right? 
So troubles are not without purpose. They are doing a work in you. They're doing a work in me. And so that's an encouraging thing when we, when we go through troubles. That they, God, it doesn't matter where they come from. God can use them for good in our lives. Thank you, Lord. What an amazing thing. What an amazing God we have. Troubles, God can create beauty out of. And our troubles are only temporary. Let's keep going. Point number three, this is my final point. Troubles. We want to move through our troubles. Okay? Move through our troubles into something else. Right? And um, I, uh, you know, Heather and I love victory. We were in a very difficult season uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we actually named our youngest child, his middle name is Victor, because we love victory so much. And we've gone through difficulties, and we just wanted to name him Victory because God has been a victor for us. He's given us victory through difficulties. We've seen victories on the other side of some of the things that were our greatest fears and some of the most challenging seasons on the other side, some of the most beautiful things came through them. And so we love victory. And it's important when you're going through troubles, you've got to remind yourself that there is victory on the other side. And Jesus reminds this church that there is victory. <laughs> I love it because you need to, in order to navigate the troubles, you've got to be able to see victory on the other side. And, and this is just eyes of faith. And look what Jesus says. He says, you know, like I said, troubles are real. He says, I know your troubles. I know, I know these people are, you know, saying these false things about you. I know that you're poor. You know, I know that you're living in extreme poverty. And then he has these, there's these parentheses in the scripture. I love this. There's these parentheses. I know your poverty. Yet you are rich, he says. There was one um, pastor, uh, I read an, an old pastor, and he says, this is heaven in parentheses. Jesus says, I know you are poor, and then in parentheses, yet you are rich. Isn't that amazing? So would you just say that with me today? I am rich. I am rich. Jesus may say to you, I know you're poor, but you say, I am rich. Jesus may say to you today, I know you feel weak, yet you are strong. So I say, I am strong. I love it. Heaven in parentheses. This is an amazing thing as believers that we have, this faith and this strength, internal strength, that to know that we are strong in him, to know that we are rich in God. And uh, so he calls us then, not only do we remind ourselves what we really have in the spiritual, supernatural realm, we have heaven with us, but also he says there's a, there's a goal at the end. And he, he goes on it towards the end. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And the crown of life, it actually, in the, I read that in the Greek of this word, it actually says the crown of the life. And what he's talking about, Jesus is talking about here, is eternal life. You live your life through this difficulties, these challenges, these troubles, all these things that can come at you with the knowledge that on the other side is a victory. And so this crown that he's actually talking about isn't a crown for like a queen or a king. This is actually a crown for the winner of a race. The, this is a, a victory crown. This is more like for us, I think we would think about a trophy. This is a trophy. You keep going, you keep enduring, and I'm going to give you the trophy of life. You keep going, you keep enduring, and I'm going to give you the, the gold belt of life. It's eternal life. And, and so we have this vision for, for life. And everything is telling us sometimes that we're beaten. But Jesus says that you are victorious. Everything is telling you that you're, you, you, you know, everything might be telling you that you're, you're losing. 
And Jesus may even be saying, I know you're losing, but you're a winner. It's amazing. So I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we, we were at the Planting Heaven conference on YouTube. And um, th at the end of the conference, uh, Brian Somerville did an interview with Katie Taylor. And Katie Taylor, probably most of you already know this, that she is a, um, she's the female athlete of the year. Uh, she is an Olympic gold medalist in boxing. She's, an, uh, she's at the very pinnacle of boxing. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that she can't get any higher than what she is at right now. She's won everything that she can win as a professional boxer. And so Brian asked her an interesting question, you know, and I want to connect this with, right, she's doing this in the physical, but I want to connect this with our spiritual walk. And he, he said to her, so Katie, what is it like living the dream? Because right now she is living the dream of everything that, that she had worked for for all her life. And, and so he said, what is it like living the dream? And Katie said something interesting she said living the dream is daily sacrifice she said uh every day you know i i don't i don't get to do what other people do every day i have to get up at 7 a.m and go for my road runs and then i go to the gym and then i eat and recover and then i go to the gym again and then i eat and recover and i go to the gym again and i do this six days a week and so living the dream, you know, he, she said, sometimes they think, okay, yeah, it looks like me in the, in, the, uh, in the ring, like with my arm up because I just won. But actually living my dream is, a, it's a sacrifice. And this is so similar to our walk as Christians. When we're entering in and walking with God, we think maybe we have this idea that it's just going to be butterflies and rainbows or whatever you know unicorns and rainbows i don't know why i think that but it's just going to be you know um time on the beach it's just going to be so fun and there's just going to be so much fulfillment and yes there is some of that but also with it is there is hard work she she went on to say you know she said my life is a training camp uh you know and um it's not you know boxing is not a just a sport it's a lifestyle she says, um, you know, not only, you know, those runs and that, she says, every day I get up and I get punched in the face. That's what living the dream looks like. And so, yet at the end she said, but my life is richer for it. So, let me just go back to the beginning. I'm just reminding us that we are kingdom athletes. We are invited to this you know, this race with God, this fight with God, this journey through difficult things. And sometimes we go through trouble. Sometimes the church goes through troubles. Jesus knows all about it, yet he calls us to, to keep on going, to have the grit to keep going. And so we may not be physically getting punched in the face every day, but there are things that do come at us, and we have to be willing to go through those with God. We're invited into a fight. And I think these few things that, you know, John shares with us, the words of Jesus to us, are so important. We got to get our head wrapped around both troubles and victory in order to continue on with God. It's so helpful. And so the last thing I just wanted to mention that Jesus says is at the very beginning. Actually, I want to go back to the very beginning of the, the passage and Again, Jesus, in order for us to go through our troubles, he wants us to see who he is. And what he wants us to see who he is, is that he is the champion. He says, I am the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus has gone through all the troubles and, and way, way more than we ever will. And he is entered through death, and it, and it says he's came to life. Another way that this could be trans translated is he's burst into life. So Jesus has been there, he's done that, and he calls us to look to him as we go through our difficulties and our journeys. 
All right, so uh, I love what Pastor Choco said at the conference. He says, God never promised smooth sailing, but he did promise a safe landing. And so I just want to pray with us today that whatever we're going through, that um, we will be encouraged into what is on the other side, encouraged for the journey through it, and that we will have everything that we need in Christ because we are rich in him. We have all the resources of heaven available to us, all right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you will bless my brothers and sisters today. You will bless me. We ask that you will help us, Lord, where we have, maybe it's been like this season of my summer holidays, where we've just got kind of lazy and sitting back and just drinking sodas, soda pops, and and staying up late and getting up late, not doing any exercise, Lord. But Lord, we, we want to enter into what you have called us to, God. That we want to enter into the race and to the fight that we have been invited into, Lord, with you. And Lord, we don't want to just be people boxing the air. We want to be hitting targets. And so we pray that you do this work in us. We pray that, Lord, for those of us who are just really discouraged, Lord God, really going through hard times, really just have our eyes down in a sense. I pray today, Lord God, that you will lift our eyes, Lord God, that you will give us the supernatural Holy Spirit strength for our eyes to be lifted up, Lord God, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, Lord. I pray when those confusing things and those lies of the enemy and those um, overwhelming experiences or, or challenges come, Lord God, that you will give us a way through them, Lord God, that you will give us clarity and your resources to walk through them, Lord God, that we would depend on you when we are weak so that we could be strong, that we would depend on you when we are poor so that in you we can be rich, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the encouragement. Lord, we, we're your church. Lord, we're your people. And we just ask you to do whatever you want to do in us, Lord God. Make us who you want to be, us to be, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sunday. Happy we are, Sunday. We are here in People's Park together. We will have fun. We will talk about David and Goliath. And I, we hope you are enjoying this weekend, this Sunday. So let, let me just start with David. He was the youngest boy in his family. Just like you, Joshua, yeah? You are the youngest. Mm -hmm. Are you happy to be the youngest? Yes. Because I'm not old. Yeah, you are not <laughs> old. And guess what? God was choosing David, but first, before his calling was there, he needed to go out to the field tending sheep. So, imagine tending sheep, going, walking with the sheep. It was a pretty boring job, but David was smart. Instead of being bored, he was playing on his harp, he was worshiping God and he was practicing his skills because sometimes he needed to kill the bears and the lions. So he was busy practicing and he was busy singing, playing for the Lord. Nice music. You know the music he was writing? It's in the Bible today. We can read them. So he was a famous musician in his time. So now I put some music, we put some music on for you guys to worship God to praise his name because he is good, he is worthy to be praised.
Joshua try to beat his enemies now. Okay, let me see how you do it. Aim. Okay, again. Go closer. Last one. Go closer. Aim. Yeah, you did it. Let's let's see. Okay. This so his yeah. His enemies are fear, anger, greed, selfishness. Laziness, disobedience, and unbelief. Okay, Ready? try again. Okay. 
I hate on the reef. You hit. That's very good. I'm proud of you. Give me five. Hi everyone. Hi. We are back. We decided to come to the car because it's getting darker and colder. So we're still talking about David and Goliath. And you remember the story of David, like uh, after he uh, was a shepherd, he was sent to bring food to his brothers to the field when uh, the fight was going on with the enemy. And there was a huge giant. His name was Goliath. Can you tell us about Goliath? Goliath was big, huge, 10 feet tall, and anything that you can imagine that, you, that will make you to be afraid. So David had a good reason to want to be afraid of Goliath. Goliath was also saying very bad words, was trying to make everybody afraid. And um, he didn't make people afraid, but David wasn't afraid of him. Yes, and why? Why? What do you think? Why? Because David believed in God and he had faith and he trusted God. And I think David also took a faith, a step in faith, because not only did he trust God, but he took a step and decided to do something about it. Yeah, and he was doing a wonderful thing. With the little stone, he just killed Goliath. You know, he, he was practicing this when he was a shepherd. He was killing lions and bears. And has, he said in himself, if God was with me that time, God is with me just like that. That reminds me of our memory verse for today. Our memory verse is Romans 8. Uh, verse 31 Romans chapter 8 verse 31 if God be for us who can be against us so you say to yourself if God be for me hear me who can be against me that means nobody even even um, Goliath even fear even disobedient doubts everything there's nothing that can be against me because I believe God is for me yes and David you know he was really strong in his faith he just saw God so big and huge and powerful, even bigger than this uh, giant called Goliath. And he was confident. He was strong in his faith. He didn't move. He didn't doubt even when he needed to stand in front of the enemy. He just did it in confidence, in faith, and God protected him. God made him kill Goliath. And all the Israelites were so happy, celebrating, shouting. And guess what? We can do the same. Because we serve the same mighty God, the same powerful, awesome God. He didn't change. He is the, the same, same yesterday, yesterday today, today, and, and forever. forever. And remember, that David didn't just sit down and listen to what Goliath said. He believed and he took a step. Yes, and you know, I encourage all of us, even myself and Yemi and all of you guys, take the step of faith against your enemies. It can be anything. Sometimes the enemy is coming from outside. Maybe people are uh, laughing at you, making joke about you, and they, they say bad words about you. But you can overcome this. You can overcome this bad feeling, this fear, this sadness, this disappointment. God can give you the power. And sometimes it's coming from inside. Sometimes it's anger. You can be easily angered. But you can pray and you can ask, Lord, I want to overcome this. I want to be free from anger. It can be disobedient when your parents say, do this, do that, please help me. You don't want to do this. You have disobedience in your heart. But God will help you to overcome it because God wants all his children to be obedient, to be in peace, in love, and in joy. That's the goal we have. And we fight for it. We don't give up. We pray for it. And we fight. And we will be overcoming all the enemies in our lives. Amen. Do you want to add something to it? I think you said everything, oh God. So for next week, uh, we will have a very big surprise, uh, wonderful things to do, and we'll be including some art and craft, and we'll have question time. So we will be asking you to have your pencil ready, pen or pencil, a piece of paper, and some markers, and anything that you use for coloring, because we'll be having coloring time and question time. And for the questions, we would be asking your parents to screenshot your answers and send them to our phone, so that we can put it on the next video. 
and if you do the art and craft as well the target what Joshua was using so you need uh, paper and markers for that and some little stones to practice and to have fun with it and just uh, see yourself killing your giant, killing your giant. <laughs> so that that was it for this week enjoy your time and don't be bored put on some worship music read your bible read your bible learn some memory verse and Romans just, 8 31 yeah and then have fun we love you so much god bless you god bless you see you next time see you next week Bye-bye. Bye-bye.